episode of Paranormal Roundtable. We're back again with Eric Palacios in the second of a three-part discussion, and he's got a lot of really cool stuff to get into, so we don't want to keep you waiting. We'll keep it short, sweet, and to the point. If you have any paranormal experiences that you'd like to submit to the show, you can do so at joshturner at prtpodcast.com. Once again, that email is joshturner at prtpodcast.com. And if you'd like to support what we're doing here, you can always become a Patreon member. If you do, we'll send you a swag bag with all kinds of goodies in it that will give you back more than your money's worth. And you can do that at patreon.com slash prtpodcast. Once again, that's patreon.com slash prtpodcast. And for those of you who are current Patreon members, we have sent out your swag bags. You will be getting your goodies in the mail. Shirts, autographed books, stickers, keychains, the works. So keep an eye out for that. And lastly, tonight's guest, Eric Palacio, has a really cool YouTube channel. It's called Media Palace. You can check him out on YouTube where you can find a lot of his work. It's fascinating stuff. You can watch his documentary, The Beast of Brushy Creek and The Legend of Harry Man Road. Go check it out. Subscribe to that channel. You won't be disappointed. Now, with all that being said, let's get right into it. So you did the documentary on the Beasts of Brushy Creek, and right. I, I recommend everybody go check that out. But you have another that the other one you did was Harry Man Road documentary. You haven't it hasn't yeah. been released yet, right? Yeah, that one hasn't been released. I do have I do have one version of it on my YouTube, but but the the official like real version it has not been. Uh, they have it. Amazon's had it since April, but they haven't released it yet. I don't know why. God, that's so weird, dude. And then, <laughs> and then, okay. So let's back up a minute. Sure. So we were talking about the Leander, the Leanderthal woman. Now, do, have mm-hmm. you done any research? I'm talking like northwest of Leander. I got a report, or we did. Anthony, me, Tony, uh, my wife. I think I don't remember which one of y'all gave it to me. One of y'all, it might have been Nelly, but wh- some somebody from my team gave me a report. Oh no, it was t- I think it was Tony. Because Tony used to live. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, t- and Tony said one of his friends, oh, I think it was stupid John. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I should have called him that. Yeah, I'm sorry. My godson has a friend. We called him stupid John because he would do stupid things. Yeah, I got a friend like that. <laughs> yeah, and he's, he's Tony's buddy. And I told Tony, he was telling me about working out. This is just kind of off there. And I told Tony, I said, I wouldn't take advice from a guy we call stupid John on how to work out, dude. <laughs> but anyway, his buddy was telling us that they saw a dog man, dog headed looking creature run alongside the the road, uh, like like right next to him, on that main highway. Uh, it, it's North Bell, yeah, oh, right, yeah, and yeah. then it becomes some yeah. other stuff. And they were out driving. Now I gotta t- I gotta be honest. They were out driving, and they were I I believe they're pretty pretty sure they were under the influence because they they that guy and his friends were potheads back in high school <laughs> and tony was like yeah th- there was this friend of mine who told me and so they were working out and that kid told he, he was a kid at the time he's not a kid anymore but he told me he said yeah my friends we saw this werewolf looking creature and i know you're you you uh talk about that stuff because i was talking about it on another show and i said yeah i, I talk about that sometime this was years ago like 2015 or 16 something like that and he said that it was a couple years before that and they saw this thing so I kind of took it with a grain of salt because you're talking about three people who smoke a lot of pot. Right. And and they were skipping school and they uh-huh. saw that and and then and it was it was in broad daylight. It was like way like out of out of the town, you know, going toward uh I guess when when you when you turn off like by San Gabriel and then it loops around and it goes to Nameless Road. It it was in that area right there. And so they saw this creature, but what what was interesting was I was at the bank at Wells Fargo, right there on 620, and there was a Hispanic guy in there, and we started talking, and he said, you know, I saw, I gave him my card, and he looked at it, and because we were talking about, I don't remember, he, we were talking what we were talking about, how we got on the subject of it, but he, we started talking, and he goes, you know, me and my wife saw this thing that looks kind of like this werewolf creature you're talking about on this card, you know, because we were talking about it, and uh, he told me, like a really interesting story and he works there at that bank and he told me that him and his wife were driving and when he told me the location it was right there like (laughs) you know so then i i got back in the truck and i told my wife and i was like well maybe stupid john is as stupid as i thought he was (laughs) so we were calling him that kind of jokingly calling him that but it it is kind of telling that that guy he saw something with his wife that was just like that and he said it was out in the field and it was walking on two legs and it looked it looked like a werewolf and when he mm. said that i just thought oh my gosh so then that's two people 
you know, now I didn't talk to John and Tony's friends, but I did talk to, 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 to John and he had said that. And I never really took much, I didn't take much stock in it. And I didn't even really go over it with anybody. Cause I didn't really think, I didn't know what to think of it. I thought maybe he was just trying to tell me that to fit in or something. But, uh, yeah, when when a, a random bank teller tells you, yeah, I saw something out there, and That's then right. I got a report from somebody who was out late, and they had gone to a car wash, and they were washing their off their truck or whatever because they had gone out in the mud and stuff. And he said, "Dude, I look across the road in a ditch, and this is off a of Baghdad road, oh, like yeah. like right yeah. there in Leander. I think it's a, uh, right. or is it Cedar Park? I think it's Cedar Park, right? Uh, Baghdad Road. There, does it run through Cedar I- Park and Leander? Or is it just?" Uh, I think I think it's both. I think it runs through I both. Check. Yeah, we have a Baghdad. There's a couple of Baghdad roads. I know Round Rock has one. I think Georgetown has one too. Yeah, the, it's a very common name over here. Uh-huh. Um, but he was saying that he got out. He drove his vehicle. And he was driving home, and he was going down Baghdad Road. Uh, he doesn't live here anymore. He lives up in Fort Worth. But he was telling me. He said, "I see this this thing up in a di- down in a ditch, and I thought it was running along in the ditch, and I thought he goes, it looked almost hyena like." But then when I saw it turn its head, it jumped up onto the onto the road, and it crawled. Like he didn't say it's it, it it ran. He said it like spider crawled across the road. And he goes, and I clearly saw, and his wife was with him. And he goes, we clearly saw like arms, like not legs. The front p- appendages were arms, dude. And so then I asked him. I said, you know, because it was a, it was a message I got. And so I asked him. I said, did you by any chance, like you know, did you you sure it wasn't like a hyena looking like it because he said it looked more wolf like after it began to crawl across the road, and he said it looked werewolf like. And I so I, I said, are you by are you by any chance that it look like a on four legged like a four legged hyena? And are you sure you weren't just mistaken the identity because you do get uh, stories of hyenas? Oh yeah, and, and it was so weird. And he said, no 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 no. He goes, at first we thought it was, but it was because it had like this uh, kind of like hump or ridge on its uh, shoulders or back, which you hear that sometimes. Yeah, I mean, it would. You know, you said we get reports of hyenas. Do we also get reports of tigers? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that's a real thing. The Texas tiger is the new cryptid. It, it <laughs> is. Know, yeah, there's some weird talk. Talk about that. Like, I mean, well, I mean, it's a real thing. People have. There's more tigers in Texas than anywhere in the world. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a fact. There's more tiger owners here in Texas than anywhere. And every year, they seem to es- at least one or two seem to escape from their enclosures or whatever and just go roaming around town i know houston i don't know if it was houston proper but the harris county uh, i think for a couple of days it was a tiger on the loose and in san antonio i remember i was there that weekend when a tiger had escaped from its enclosure and was roaming (laughs) around san antonio and it took three days to cash it from what i understand you know i got a report of a tiger near ellinger you know where ellinger's at is that by dallas no no no. it's it's going east like off of i-10 i think i think i think it's Speaking of Lagrange, we're talking about Lagrange earlier. If you cut across uh, seventy one I ten, whatever. Okay, yeah, gotcha. Yeah, Ellinger's in there. There's a bakery there, but I had somebody. That's all I know about is has a good check bakery. That's all I know. (laughs) But and and so this guy was driving through there, and he he asked. He just sent me a report. He said that that he saw a tiger back in two thousand, I think fourteen. He said he was driving along. He's like he was a truck driver. He's very tired, and he goes and I see a tiger, full grown tiger, running alongside the the road and then it just it, it took off and it jumped over a barbed wire fence and was gone into the brush and he goes i just saw a bengal tiger like when he, the way he described it had to be and i told him i said you know it's probably an escaped uh, animal yeah it's a real thing and i know my buddy who uh he was really into uh, uh what, like those cats that you're allowed to have they're kind of like in between but a big cat and a small cat like I don't know. They're the Savannah oh, cats servals. or something. Ser- yeah, yeah, those, servals, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And he had told me about where he got it from that uh, they had supposedly a couple of links that had escaped and they were like still unaccounted for. And that was you know a couple of years back. I'm not sure what happened there, but yeah, I mean, it, it happens more frequently than, than you would expect. And a lot of times, unfortunately, people don't call the authorities because they're afraid of getting in trouble. So it's like they'll take their chances. I mean, if you find a, a lynx or something out there, how it's going to be a little hard to track it back or, you know, unless they have a really good department at doing that. I don't know. But it's a real thing, man. It happens. Even, you know, wolves and stuff like that, like hyenas. I think there's been a couple of reports that hy- people owning hyenas that have also gotten loose, too. Yeah, they always manage to get loose. That's what's crazy. And like, <laughs> yeah. like out there by the lake where we were working, there were lemurs. 
Remember oh, Anthony, yeah, the lemurs out there? Yeah. 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 There were lemurs out there and we were driving along and I think Anthony, you were probably, you know, in your older teens or something. And we were out there checking after that we, they had already built everything. And on that, on that ridge, on that wall, remember that lemur was running? Yeah. yeah he was just running that. along. And I yeah. said, there he is, right? There's a lemur. And I've had reports of lemurs here off of a Harry Man Road too. A woman I was talking to said she saw a giant lemur just in the trees like when she was out for her jog. And then she had gone to like her book club or something like that and mentioned it. And then another woman's like, oh my God, you saw it too. So, I mean. Yeah. And we have a parrot colony too here in, in, in uh, Austin, yeah. in North Austin. One of the pet stores, I guess it burned a few years ago. And my wife, she she's always on the lookout for them because when she sees them, she's like, oh, look, there they are. And we were literally right there on 183 and Burnett Road. And we look up and I've seen them also off of far west. Um, and and there's this huge, just huge pack of of green parrots and they've flourished. I don't know how they survive the winter because, I, I, you know, they're tropical birds, but they do. Well, I mean, you, you want to talk about surviving winters. Have you heard about these, the alligators they had in Kyle? Oh, Texas yes. Up there? <laughs> yeah, because because they go into hibernation. that They, they mean, can it, slow their pulse it, down. It's so crazy. They actually killed a dog out there. Maybe two dogs. I know that, but they got at least one. And they've been out there since like 2008, supposedly. They've had two two uh, different sets of, of uh, exterminators go out there and thought they got rid of them all. But I think the last time a dog was killed was like in 2019, maybe, or maybe even 2021. But, and you're wondering like, how the heck do they, we, we froze a couple of times. In oh between, man. You know? Yeah. It, it, that, it's weird. Yeah. And then you always hear these accounts too, where uh, the Colorado river, people have spotted alligators, you know, floating in the area or even in the, uh, I think even in the, uh, what's the Guadalupe river too. Mm -hmm. You hear these reports about alligators and you're like, Jesus, how did they get this far West? It's insane. Yeah. And bull sharks. I've heard of bull I've sharks heard that too. Yeah. I've yeah. Heard that too. They, they swim yeah. up into the, because bull sharks, you know, and they go really far, far up into the, into the, to the waterways and, and they can make their home anywhere because not, and they don't have to just stay in, in salt water or even brackish water. They, they actually come all the way into the fresh water because bull sharks can, uh, they have a special ability to desalinate, you know, so it doesn't, it doesn't affect them. And it's really crazy. The the things that people see, speaking of w when you and I were talking and, and back on the subject of the bear man, and I told you I had a couple of witnesses who had given me stories of one of whom actually she came on the show and, and talked about what she saw uh, out there in the hill country. And David Weatherly is a good friend of mine. And he has been getting reports near Blanco of this oh, bear, yeah. bear man. Now, do, do you know the story of the bear man, like in Marble Falls and how it started? Yeah. Do, yeah do you want to tell the audience that? Yeah. So uh, it was a uh, Marble Falls area, I believe it was 1901. And to this day, that newspaper is actually in the Library of Congress, I believe. Uh, it's like framed in there. You can go and look at it. Uh, and I believe also the, those two big newspapers picked it up. That was, it was the uh, San Francisco B. And then I can't remember the other one. Both of them had illustrations in there of the bear man. Uh, 1901. I believe the woman's name was Remy. I can't remember her last name. She was out there. Uh, she was kind of like a shepherd. She had goats and sheep out there in, in on one of the hills there in Marble Falls. And uh, as she's getting ready to go home, she's walking on what they call a chaparral, which is like a, kind of like a trail in between the brush there and out pops uh, what she's described as a big hairy beast. And, uh, it apparently it grabs her, throws her over her shoulder and takes her to a cave, uh, which is, I believe off of what they call moon mountain in the area. And we do have a place called moon. I believe, I don't know if it's called moon mountain or moon mountain road, but it's there in marble falls. And, um, supposedly she was held there for a couple of days. Uh, when the parents, hadn't heard from her they started to get worried and they kind of organized a posse to go look for her and uh, apparently this group of cowboys ended up well she had she she was able to escape apparently she was able to escape and this group of cowboys ended up finding this bear man uh in the cave surrounded by bones and other you know relics there i guess and uh it charged them and supposedly they exterminated shot and exterminated and buried it there in the hills of Marble Falls. And that's the story we, we have to this day. And I believe that cave is in the Balcones Canyonlands. So it's a protected area now. You can't really, even if you want to film in that, air, that area, it's $200 a day 
to film in that area commercially. Jeez. So it, it and for me, if Josh, I think I told you about the uh, the Bear Man face, which is not far from that area of Marble Falls. And oh, to yeah. me, that is the best evidence of a Bear Man, maybe even Dog Man, if you want to say. But for me, that is the best evidence we have of some type of creature like that. It is literally a face chiseled into a stone that has fangs, uh, snarling eyes, and you can clearly see it. Now, the story we have from that area is that that's the bear man. That's what the uh, Native Americans actually, they made this this uh, this cutout just to warn people, hey, this is the bear man. This is in this area. And supposedly, there are other carvings along Bear Creek Trail, uh, along Bear Creek, which is, you know, right there, not far from Marble Falls. And I mean, I have that image. I, I don't. I don't think I've sh- sent it to you, Josh, but I have it. We only have one image that was taken in 1965, black and white photo. But you can clearly see it has fangs, and it's a stone face that someone put a lot of work into. And there's the story of the bear man who, uh, what the natives say was a. Um, the natives pretty much described the skinwalker in so many words. They said it was a medicine man that was able to change from a a man into a bear creature, even possibly wolf that roamed in that area. And we have a stone face that's there to me. That's literally like written in stone there. You know, I don't care what you say. That's, that's there. And I mean, I, why would they put something there that, you know, spend that much time just for fun? Yeah. yeah, Just, just playing around. Yeah. Yeah. I can't really, see any point to that but uh when i first heard about it i started researching it and multiple people have said of seeing strange creatures out there kind of uh, reminiscent to the bear man and when you hear about it it's a little different from like you know maybe a bigfoot or a sasquatch you hear it's you you when you hear about it you, you they describe it as more of like a skinny type of thing uh not necessarily so big more of a man size but it's skinnier um even mangy to some point, I believe some people have even said that, but that's right there. I mean, we have two, we have a story from 1901 and we have a carving that's only, that was made God knows when. And I'm really trying to get out there. I want to work on another documentary project where I go out there and take high definition photos, LIDAR scans. And I was even talking to um, Doug Hycheck, who was from Monster Quest. Oh yeah. Good friend and, of mine. Uh, yeah, he great guy, and he recommended that I contact uh, Skull Walter, I believe was his name. He had a show on History Channel where he's a uh, a geologist that specializes in this type of of weird stuff, I guess. Uh, History on Earth or something like that. He had a show, History on Earth, I think. Um, but he told me to reach out to him, and I and I might end up doing that. The only problem is that area is infested with gigantic hogs, mm-hmm. and I'm talking about like hogs, big ones, hogs. big, big, yeah. big ones. Oh in my fa- god! In huge. fact, I, there's somebody who shot one out there uh, at one time. I think the record was out there near Granger Lake, but yeah. the, this person shot one and it just shattered that. And and I'm not 100 percent on this one, but I think Anthony, one of our fr- our our cousin's friend. His his buddy shot the uh, was fourteen hundred pounds or something. It was oh. yeah, I believe so. Yeah, it was it was unbelievable, and it wasn't far from there. Yeah. So so I mean, you're you're. I was I was gonna say I was waiting for you to finish. <laughs> I was gonna say <laughs> you got to worry about two or three things: there rattlesnakes, ticks, oh, yeah. of course, and then you always have to worry about hogs, and they are horrible. And and people do not. They just don't understand it. Like I was wearing my. I have a, a chain I wear on the show, and I have a a boar's tusk and this lady just got all over me. She was like, Oh, you Josh Turner, you're wearing a tiger's claw. <laughs> I said, <laughs> I said, no, ma'am, that's a, she's like, tigers are majestic animals. I said, Oh, maybe they are, but this isn't a tiger's claw. It's a boar's tusk. <laughs> and she's like, well, boars are majestic animals. And I'm like, no lady, this is not game of Thrones. Right. Okay. These animals are a nuisance yeah. animal. And that, that tusk came off of a, over a 400 pound boar, but you're talking about an animal from what we were told by my cousin's friend, he he said, and I don't want to say his name on here because I don't know if that's a if that's a hundred percent correct because we were told this, but uh, he claimed that it was fourteen hundred pounds, and that's a thousand pounds bigger than that tusk of the one that I wear on my neck. I can yeah, imagine that. That, that. Yeah, that's that's like a bull. <laughs> it's like a, if you can imagine something the size of a bull. Now I have seen pictures of these things that look like they're the size of a bull, and I had a rancher. Uh, tell us out near Brenham that his uh, bull actually got into it with a hog. 
that was almost like maybe three quarters the size of it. And you're talking about a, a Brahma bull and you're going like, are you kidding me? Like, that's crazy. And like, they were squaring off and this, and then there was another lady, um, she was out near, uh, Gerald, I think outside, outside of Gerald and her horse got like hamstrung by a hog. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, these things are vicious. Yeah, we had them really bad here around like the 2010, 2013, around that time. And I actually have a video of being attacked by a hog. I'm coming home at like 2 o'clock in the morning, and uh, I'm going through the back door, which is kind of like a barn. And uh, out from nowhere, this freaking albino hog comes out. Oh, my god! And I kick it in the face, and I think that kind of stunned <laughs> it. And it gave me, like, a chance to – I moved this big cage that we had in front of it, and I was able to kind of, like, run away. But it's on my channel. Uh, but, yeah, I was, I, was, I was lucky it was only one. If it was more than one. Oh, man. Yeah. And, and yeah. if they get you down, they'll gut you so oh, yeah. quick. Yeah, I mean, that's what just... I was worried about. This one looked more like a razor back. It looked yeah. weird. Oh yeah, because because they, they've bred what they've done, Eric. Is you know this they, but for the audience, they they have literally bred these feral hogs are now like a mixture hybrid of a javelina, a razorback type hog, and mixed with you know, like a wild boar basically mixed with mm -hmm. like a domesticated animal, and it's created kind of like when you take a tiger and a lion, it's created like this liger, you know, yeah. that's just humongous. But but they're not sterile; they can breed. The liger can't actually breed, but but these things can breed, and they are just horrible. And they are, yeah. and, and they and you see deer like uh, Monday night. Actually, this is Thursday night as we're recording this. Monday night, which would have been just three or four days ago, uh, my wife and I. I think it was I think it was Sunday night or Monday night. We saw a a buck right there off of uh, Spicewood Springs, and and it was limping. And I said, "Oh look, its leg is broken." Immediately, my wife was like, oh, hogs, because she's been here long enough now. She knows. We saw a big old pack of them. I'm talking like 20 of them, and they were all black, and they were just right there off Spicewood Springs. And, we, and it's crazy because like maybe the week before, we saw a lady like walking through there with her dog, and we noticed the dog because my wife was like, oh, look, that's a, that's a kind of dog I want because she had a Australian Shepherd or something like that. And I told my wife, I said, right there, there was a lady walking her dog. And like literally a week later, there's 20 hogs right there in that field. They would have tore her and that dog apart. And these people have no idea how close they come to yeah. these creatures. Like they just have no freaking clue. Yeah, we got 29 right there. You'll find them just kind of on the side of the road, ones that have been hit. And I mean, even driving through there, you'll get like 10 or 15 that cross the road, you know, when you're heading west. Uh, no, it's, it's a real thing. I don't think people... They don't live here. Understand how bad it how bad it is, man. It's, how dangerous it is. Dangerous I can't believe you got attacked. Going, going. How big yeah. was it? Like how big was the? It wasn't that big. It was probably a little bit l shorter than where my knee went. Uh, but it was the good thing was it was in the barn, so there was like close quarters. And if you got if you give those things space, they'll that's when they get their momentum going and mm -hmm. they'll they'll get you down. So I was like, as soon as I walked in, I saw it to the left of me, and it kind of saw me, and it made a move, but it wasn't. It, it was like it wasn't a charge, but it moved forward, and boom! I just kind of kicked it in the nose, and uh, I had a bunch of sand in my on my shoes, so I think that might have just kind of distracted it for a minute. Man, but it went it went right after me after that kick, and I got a big old crate and I put it in between us, and it was still trying to go around the crate, but I managed to get inside. That's what, and that's the thing people don't understand is if if you kick it or you know get get after a canine, sometimes they'll leave you alone, but a hog does not stop. Yeah. They, no, they just get kick. madder. I mean, I, I played soccer for a long time and I kicked the crap out of it and it was just, <laughs> oh it just stunned it, you know, just like, whoa, what was that? And then, okay, let me, I'm going to get you now. You enough know? time for you to get something to get away from it. Yeah, man. just me... enough time to get something in between us. Yeah. Have you, have you investigated any of these reports out there? Now, this, this is also going back to the area where I was just talking about on my show, uh, you know, last Tuesday, uh, where the guy got attacked by these dog man looking creatures, but th that area there was a there was a guy who claimed to have seen a hog that was ripped in half. Now I'm talking like he said it was probably a 600 pound animal, and it was right below a tree, and there was blood on the tree. So something may have actually picked it up, if you can believe this. And he and it slammed it against the tree. And when when he, I think he said it was like 2009 when 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 that happened when he saw that with his with his friend. They were driving along and they just saw like part of a hog, and they were like they stopped and to look. And uh, he was like, dude, I didn't have like, we didn't have really good camera phones back then. 
Um, but he goes, dude, I couldn't really take a good picture of it. It was at night, but he's like, dude, it, but it was, it was a hog and it looked like something had picked it up and slammed it against an oak tree and just, it was in half. That's crazy. I mean, I've seen some hogs, you know, like I said, on the, on the side of the road and stuff that were like just a half, a half of a hog where they didn't have the, the lower half. Uh, I've seen that more than once. That's right there off of 29. Two. What, what do you uh, think that is? I mean, he, I it didn't, he said it looked yeah. like something had slammed it against that tree. Said it, and I asked him this and I was like, are you sure it wasn't like somebody hit it, you know? Which, if you hit a hog dead on, you could flip your vehicle very easily. But oh, yeah. He said they would have been a wreck. I said, yeah, you're probably right. But what could take a hog and tear it in half like that and then not eat it? Yeah, I mean, this is probably the same thing that's tying a coyote into a knot, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, what do you, yeah. I mean, for your money, would it be like Bear Man, Dog Man, Bigfoot? What I mean, would that be? I, to be honest, I think it would have to be something that has thumbs, you know? Yeah. That's just the way I look at it. Uh, and the one, like I said, the coyote was not only uh, tied into a knot, but it was turned inside out and tied into a knot. Like they took, it looked like whatever did this took all the choice pieces of meat or the organs. Like there was no heart, no lungs, nothing like that. It looked like it, and there's, I have the picture of it. The jaws are upside down. It's flipped inside out. Oh God. And it's, it's, there's no innards there. All the innards are gone. I mean, what could do that? I've, I've I've only heard of I think someone told me in Florida about seeing snakes turned inside out and tied into a knot like that too. Yeah, I've heard of that too. Yeah, and skunk ape gets blamed for that sometimes. Uh, I believe that the skunk ape is is completely different than than the actual these Bigfoot that people run into because there's a lot of different types of Bigfoot. I mean, but these Bigfoot, I think down in Florida, I, I, I tend to believe there's a guy that came on my show, Gary Brand from Within the Myths podcast, and he made a good point on the live stream. He was talking about how these things. And he was at my conference. He was actually a really good uh, speaker, but he was talking about these things being uh, like baboons. I mean, not baboons, uh, orangutans. And but you know they they have a dark hair like a lot of yeah. them, but they look like orangutans. I mean the. Uh like I told you, the guy who actually found the a coyote that was turned inside out and the, the post that was uh, bent like a banana, he spent a lot of time in Louisiana, and he showed me a couple of photos. They're probably the best photos I've ever seen of something. I'm not going to say what, but it was something. And it was an orange color like that. Like you're saying orangutan. It was orange. Uh, it was right in somebody's driveway. It's like a three quick snap, like three photos. You see you see one pretty good, and then you see another one, and the, the third one, you really don't see anything. It's already into the woods at that point. Uh but again, it's it's like this type of orange color. And I'm not sure if that happens when it's something that has like a bigger rainfall or whatever, or if they're maybe just more wild in those type of areas. I They do seem more feral. Like the reports here, I've, I might get into it a little bit later, but they, they seem more, uh, at least from what I've heard, more man-like. Man-like, yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess it would be like if, if you look at it that it's a physical thing, then it would be hominid versus hominin. Mm -hmm. But, I, you know, some of the reports I get, and like when I wrote my book, the, the, the Bigfoot Phenomenon, I interviewed, gosh, over two dozen people. And then we kind of settled on these these certain people, you know, and they were people from the, around the field, you know, and, and that, that, you know, are known. Well, not all of them, but a lot of them, like Jesus Payan, Claudia Ackley, God rest her soul. But they had the, the, just a lot of weird stuff that went on along with these Bigfoot reports. And when I did the Bigfoot thing with 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 Barton Nunley, the author from Kentucky, one of the things that we noticed was a lot of people had been abducted. There were a lot of abductees. And, you know, there's a guy out near Giddings who has been telling us stories of this creature that looks like a Bigfoot and his nephews have seen it. His son has seen it. Um, but they, but it has sort of a snout, like it's weird looking, but it has, it doesn't have those backward bent legs that you get with the dog man reports. It's a straight legged creature. So we, we think it's like what they call a gugui. And, and when I was at the paranormal festival with Ken Gerhard, uh, somebody after he did his uh, talk or whatever, um, you know, he's a cryptozoologist and they, a bunch of people were coming up and talking to him and, and I was standing there and he, he was kind of referring people to me when they were coming up with the dog man reports. And then we got some weird reports of a short snouted creature and the lady sent me the uh, recording that she had, she made a recording of it. Um, not, not a, not a video, but like, like her story. And so I'm going to play that uh, on the show at some point, but she, she, um, if she doesn't just come on and tell it. 
But what they saw was weird. It was like a rangy looking, tall, kind of thin looking creature, but it was black and it, and it had green in its fur. <clears throat> and I thought that was so weird. And it was from South Texas. That is weird. Yeah. And so you get these weird reports, but uh, you know, I know I haven't gotten like a green Bigfoot report like here in, in, in this area, but it's, it's not something I haven't heard of before. But like when you've investigated some of these reports, because I know you've done a lot of, and you're like an investigative journalist, you know. It's what my background. Yeah, yeah that's uh, your background. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, from like I told you that what I've heard is uh, when that cemetery was destroyed, there was sightings of what people were saying was a white Sasquatch in the area. I'd never heard that before. I think in uh, there's photos circulating or a video of some of like a white one. I don't know if that's like Kentucky or wherever, uh, something like that. But uh, yeah, I mean, green, I yeah. <laughs> never, it's, I, I've heard stories too of that, but I think the ones I've heard is like Pacific Northwest or Pacific something Northwest. Like that. That's what I got. Yeah, that's exactly where I, mine was up near Oregon. Well, not mine, but like somebody gave me a report. Um, this, this lady gave me a report. She's like, she just messaged me out of the blue. It was on messenger. And she was like, and I was showing Tony and I was, he was like, I was like, look at this. this woman's asking about, if I ever heard of a green Bigfoot? And so I said, no, at that time, that was like 2019. And she goes, well, I got two stories of it. And it wasn't her. It was actually her sister and her sister's husband. They had one in a Creek now down, down by their, their house. And um, I think it was near Salem, but it was like green Bigfoot. And it was like the fur, like the light in the daytime refracted off of it like it was green and the eyes were green. And I thought, dude, that is so weird. And like you get these reports, man, and like what you're talking about, the white Bigfoot. I've talked about it on my show. There was a guy that sent us a report when he was a teenager, him and his dad. And here again, this happened right outside of Cedar Park. It was years ago. Um, I think he said it was around 2000. And he said that – that uh, and if you're out there listening and, and you want to correct me, maybe I'm wrong uh, – get in touch with me because I'd like to have you talk about that. But anyway, uh, he sent me this report and I can't remember his name. It's been so long, but, and it was there again, it was on messenger and we looked at it and he said that him and his dad, and I've said this on the show before, but it, it was in pieces and it was a white Bigfoot. He goes, dude, I, I looked at it. The face was kind of like in between. I think, I think he said it was like an ape like face mixed with like, like a, like kind of a troglodyte, you know? Yeah, and it was just he said it was torn to pieces, and I and so I I covered that case with David Weatherly. We kind of talked about it, and I said, "What do you think that could be?" And he said, "Man, the only thing I could think of is another Bigfoot killed it and did that." Man, you know? Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, we put it that way. Yeah, it sounds pretty crazy. You said green eyes earlier, and uh, one of the sightings that took place right here in the Brushy Creek that happened in 2017. Like I said, there was a lot of activity. It was a, a doctor actually who uh, had an encounter in his backyard that right next to his composting uh, area where he would throw food scraps. And he said that he saw a tall being that had green eye shine uh, that was kind of like almost signaling to his dogs. And uh, the dogs, when they saw it, they got excited. Like they weren't scared. They were actually excited and they ran to it. Oh, no. And so, uh, yeah, he didn't, nothing happened, but he, he said he saw it. And, and I've spoken with that guy and I'm trying to get him to do a, uh, an interview. He's just not sure yet. Like I said, he's a, I believe he's a doctor and all this other type of stuff. So he might be worried about his reputation, but his story is incredibly thorough. Uh, and the way he recounts it is just like, man, golly, he saw something, you know, he saw something right here. Was, did, did he get a color of the fur or did it have fur? Or? He said he saw a big black figure with, with eye shine. And he, fe he felt it had fur because he didn't see any type of clothes, like wearing clothing. And he said he would have noticed if it had clothing or not, but he didn't see any clothing. He didn't get a good look at the face. He just said that he saw the green eye shine and, uh, he saw it for a good little, good little while. He said, he said he was just kind of hanging back while it was going through his composting area. And, uh, yeah, he said, uh, when he opened the door, his dogs ran right to it. Oh, that's weird. I wonder why they, if they had interacted with it before or something like. Yeah. And he, he didn't say it was huge. And that's the thing in this area. I really haven't heard like huge. I, I've heard tall and skinny. And I'm not sure if that's like an adaption they have that helps them. Because I think I honestly think if there is something here, it's using the cave system like that. They, oh, they would yeah. have to use the cave. System. Absolutely. And there's just so many caves that interconnect with each other. That's that's where my brain goes. 
And if you did that effectively, you could remain hidden for a really, really long time. See, that's why I, I, I said something, you know, one day, and not to disrespect people who, who go out in the field and search out in the woods and stuff, but I just don't think you're going to find them there. I think that they, they go into the cave systems. And I think that one of the reasons why there's so many Bigfoot reports in certain areas is because if you look at a map, and you've seen, I'm sure we've all seen the map the, the, right, of yeah. the Bigfoot sightings. And when me and my brother, we made a map, um, you know, of Devil's Backbone. Oh, yeah. And, and of course, <clears throat> the east side was just inundated with Bigfoot. And then the west side was inundated with, and I told you about this, the, the dog man. And these things, I, I, I just, there's caves all over the place. So you could probably wander around for weeks out there. You might catch one topside, but I think that they're inside the earth. And there was a guy that wrote about them, Burt Wall. And, um, you know, me and you talked about this too. And, and he was talking about in one of his books that they, these ranchers had a bunch of uh, animals that were killed. There was this depredation going on and they, they tracked a goat into that cave. Oh yeah. But when yeah. I talked to one of the bartenders up there at the tavern or whatever, he said that, no, I'm pretty sure that Bert was talking about a goat man because the purgatory road, you know, there's legends of goat man. I talked to an old biker out there just, just not even four or five months ago who claimed that he saw the, the, the goat man, which is black and it, and it comes out of that cemetery Yeah, and, and the cemetery seemed to hold a lot of the weirdness around these, uh, these creatures, man. I, I don't know what that is, man. Like you're talking about the cemetery out there in San right. Bass. San Bass. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, I, I agree with you 100%. And here uh, in the area, we had a, uh, you were talking about like the goat being tracked from the cave. When I was there filming the Beast of Brushy Creek, like I said, I went to the Harry Man Road and I was talking with the construction workers that were out there. And I was speaking with them in Spanish. They were Hispanic guys. And they were telling me about three caves they had found. I found one of them. <laughs> it was kind of like a sinkhole. But the other one, the guy told me he'd seen deer come out of it. And I was like, holy crap, wow. that must be a huge cave for deers to come out of it. Like, he's like, I've seen deer come out of it. I was like, geez, it's amazing. I couldn't find it. I couldn't really find it. I was by myself, and you have to watch where you're walking in the area. Uh, but I did find the first one they told me, and it's just like a straight down hole. And I drop stuff in there, and you could just hear it rattle around and keep rattling around for what feels like forever. Uh, but they did mention to me a cave where they saw deer coming out of that cave. And not only that, but I believe it was in. I want to say Georgetown. It was in like the 60s or 70s about a man who had actually had a goat missing and they tracked it back to, I'm not sure. It might not be, the, it might be the same story. I'm not sure, but uh, they tracked it back to this cave in Georgetown and he wanted to seal up the cave, but the, the county wouldn't let him do that because apparently he had these endangered spiders that lived in this only cave. <laughs> It was this only cave that apparently they lived in. And so they're like, nope, you're not sealing nothing, even though it's on his land. And he sued them and they went back and forth and he ended up losing. Uh, so that cave is still out there unsealed, uh, full of these spiders, I guess. And who knows what else? <laughs> but, to save some spiders. I'm not a spider yeah. person. <laughs> I can well, yeah, tell you they, right now, burn that burn that thing. <laughs> <laughs> but they tracked they track the uh, whatever took this goat to that cave. And he's like, all right, we're sealing it up. Forget this. You know, and that scared him enough to want to seal it up. And he tried doing it. But no, the uh, whoever the biologist was in the area is like, no way, you're not doing that. And, and it's weird because we do have endangered species here, like the salamander from mm -hmm. New Braunfels there that's endangered and it's protected. Uh, that's only found in the Edwards Aquifer, which is it's weird, man. It's a weird spot. Taking out all the other all the other, you know, cryptid and paranormal stuff. It's weird just in that, you know, Yeah, <laughs> that we have so many endangered species here. Birds also that are endangered in the balconies. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, man. Yeah. When you drive around too, you'll see like the signs that say Ed recharge zone, you know, Edward's yeah. aquifer. Yeah. And, and it's really sad though, too, because a lot of the green belt here in Austin is being destroyed. It's because of the homelessness. Right. Yeah. And they have really, it's just, it's bad. They, ha it's gotten really bad. I saw some pictures not too long ago and I was like, oh my gosh, it's horrible. Yeah. No, it's, it's really bad. And you, you were talking about the green belts earlier and we're going to have to keep an eye on this, Josh. I don't know if you've heard about the proposed walking trail they're, they're working on here. Uh, it's going to be from San Antonio to Marble Falls. What? Yeah. They're planning on making a walking trail. Now, 
you, you can only imagine the stuff they're going to dig up and find oh or run into gosh. while they're constructing this. Yeah. Yeah, look it up. It's, it, they just proposed it, a walking trail uh, from San Antonio all the way to Marble Falls, which would be a beautiful walk. You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> really gorgeous. But I, I do believe they're going to they're definitely going to find some things and definitely find some caves that haven't been found before. And, you know, who knows what else they might find. Well, how many there. people are going to get bit by rattlesnakes on that thing? And then they're going to be like, this was a terrible idea. Right. Yeah. <laughs> After they, yeah. The, the, that area now near Bar- Marble Falls, and Marble Falls is a beautiful city. Mm-hmm. And, and so is New Braunfels. But both of those places have tons of stories of like, like yeah. what you were talking about, the bear man. Um, th- those stories are just everywhere in that, in that area and like the Guadalupe and then in the, in the Kamal too, th- those rivers, oh, yeah. you get like these crazy stories. I had one that I told on my show, uh, not too long ago that they, these people, they were, I can't remember what, what when, when we told it, I think it was a live stream last week, but this guy went into the water. Oh, it was last Sunday and he went into the water and this Bigfoot type creature that they had seen off of this little stream off of the Guadalupe over there by, it's over there by River Road, like in between uh, San Marcos and, uh, yeah, yeah and, and New Braunfels. And this this guy claimed when he was a teenager that this Bigfoot type creature came out of a hole mm. uh, uh, under the water and grabbed him and tried wow. to pull him in. And and so it was crazy. When, and when you think about it, you know, like these Bigfoot, they can swim, you know, but this thing, I mean, for it to have been in that hole, can it breathe underwater? Because like, how the heck does that work? I mean, I kept think, trying to wrap my mind around it, and I talked to his friend's sister, who was the only other person that 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 we could that we corresponded with, and she was like, "No, that really happened. Like, we saw this thing standing there because they were tubing, you know." And then when he when he kind of when they got in the water, like off of that little offshoot right there, and it was a time when the water was pretty high. It was after it, after it had flooded, and it was like a few months after. And so that Bigfoot type creature just got down in the water and disappeared. And they thought it's laying down. No, it was inside one of these holes right there. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard of people noodling in those holes and stuff. And actually when I was, uh, we'd go tubing down there too. And we'd go fishing down there and, and a couple of my cousins and stuff, they would go noodling and they would, I wasn't there, but they would literally stick one of the taller cousins into one of these holes and he would come out with a gigantic catfish and they asked him, like, is there more in there? And he's like, there's a bunch in there, you know, and that's just one little pocket cave uh, along the Guadalupe River right there. They're full of underground caverns and underground aquifers and stuff. Oh, it's just riddled with it. Yeah. And on your documentary, like, like you interview people, like, like yeah. h- how many people describe to you this beast of the Brushy Creek? I'm going back to the Brushy Creek thing. Like, yeah. Like how I mean, many... Yeah, I mean it's it's quite a few. The the ones that I I mean I've had so many stories sent to me. It's it's, it's a lot, uh, but the ones that I've actually interviewed have they've been quite a few. And and uh, recently I, I interviewed a woman here who's it's going to be in my next documentary, Expedition Brushy Creek, and she had her sighting uh, in Cedar Park right off of uh, the Brushy Creek there, and uh, hers was unbelievable. Her sighting. She's basically talking about getting home. Uh, from a late night and uh, her and her sister are walking to the house. And as they pull up, they see what they think is a cow in the neighbor's yard. And like, what the heck's a cow doing in the yard? And that's not unheard of. She said that where they live behind the house, there was, they had cows, a pasture with cows. And so she's like, well, who do we call to get this cow out of here? And she says, as they're getting out of the car, the cow stands up (laughs) and they're looking at it. And she, she described, and she, I have it the, interview it's amazing she describes seeing this tall hairy thing and it has the face of a native american is what she says she says it looks like a native american that has really long straight hair and it's just looking at them and then all of a sudden it starts screaming and she says when it started screaming she went deaf she couldn't hear anything at that point and then it started running towards them oh my gosh. and as it's running towards them the sister screamed and when the sister screamed it kind of like snapped her out of it and when this when the thing heard the sister scream it beelined and pretty much did a cannonball into this brush and it just disappeared after that but when she tells the story it's it's amazing and she has a lot more details uh, in it than what i just described but that's right along the brushy creek and you 
every story I've heard has been an aggressive encounter. It's never like, oh, I saw it and we, you know, we, we got to watch it for a couple of minutes. No, this thing wants you out of the area, whatever it is. And, uh, you know, I've had that experience myself getting chased out of the Brushy Creek when it was, it was a drought in the area. And, uh, in a, in the legend of Harry man road, the documentary hasn't been out yet. Um, I interviewed a guy who actually reached out to me, who's a ex air force guy. He's walking along one of the brushy Creek trails. He, they call it rucking, I guess. I don't know. Rucking. And he's out there rucking with a buddy of his. And he says, as they're approaching this one area, this woman comes up to him and she's wearing like 1970s workout attire. And she said that she was being followed by someone in the brush that was that was you know close by and uh they helped her get back to her car in the parking lot and they went back to see whatever this thing was and about close to 100 yards away they see something peeking behind a tree and they have they took a photo of it he took two photos of it. they're in the they're in the documentary and you see something that looks really weird poking its head out it looks like it's poking its head out and uh he told me they took their time uh, Well, on the video. He says, we took our time getting there. What he told me in person is they were so scared. They turned around. He didn't want to say that on camera because he's a military guy or whatever, but you know, I hope I don't get in trouble for saying that, but he said they turned around uh, and then afterwards they went back and they didn't see anything, but he did get a, uh, uh, print from this thing behind a tree and it's not a footprint to me. What it looks like, it was like a knee print, like it was kneeling in the ground. But uh, that's in the Legend of Harry Man Road documentary. And then I interview my good friend, Jordan, who has a really crazy encounter about being right on the Harry Man Road. And uh, he would go there almost every day. And he talks about taking an ex-girlfriend out there. And uh, he left her. They were having like a picnic out there. It was late or whatever. And he went to an area where he had cached a bunch of of books and soups and other stuff like that he was going to cook out there and he said when he left her uh, she described seeing these small little shadow things poking their head out or whatever that's what she described it's in the documentary and he said that he came running out uh and that he pretty much scared them all off or whatever and that she never described it until like they had broken up and it was a long time after that but he has his own encounter being out there with a with an ex-marine and he was, again, just kind of chased out of the area. And he said this thing followed them home. He was living off of Double Creek at the time, which is not far from uh, Harry Man Road. And he, he says he, he kept hearing this almost dog barking, uh, duck quacking noise as they were getting home. And he says when they got home, you know, you, he, he described saying, he, he describes in the documentary, he says, when you get home, you usually feel like you're safe or whatever, like that's home base. And he's like, we could not sleep. We were still terrified this thing was going to come in somehow and get us. That's how scared he was. But when you see these people tell the story in real time coming from them, it, it, it adds more validity than me just telling it. But but it, multiple people have seen this. And then I had an email recently, as recent as like last month, about someone, a bus driver, who is driving uh, off of the Brushy Creek Road. And you know, you have bus drivers have to stop on the railroad tracks or whatever. They said when they stopped, they looked in the rearview mirror and they saw this hairy thing right next to the bus and it slaps the bus. And apparently the kids also saw it. I haven't confirmed this side, this sighting yet. This one just came into me, like I said, last month. Uh, but apparently the kids saw it and it slapped the side of the bus. And I think I know exactly where that's at. So I'm really hoping to get some more information and possibly interview the bus driver and maybe some kids uh, for that story. But that would be that would be awesome. I mean, I have stories of, of Boy Scouts being out there along the Brushy Creek Road and being scared. You know, they were doing like an overnight camping trip out there and they couldn't they couldn't pack it. They got so scared they had to leave. And you hear these stories and it's kind of like it goes all the way back to the original Harry Man Road story. And there's a lot of mythology surrounding the Harry Man Road about how it got its name. And the, the story we all hear as, as kids is that. When the settlers and covered wagon times were traveling through the area, uh, a boy was left behind and he kind of became a wild man out there. That's the story we always hear about. But when I did the digging and research, I actually found a book written by the postmaster at the time. And he says in the book, I'm going to tell you the real story of how the Harry Man Road got its name. 
And it was in 1966, a group of kids out there, we know all their names, were hanging out there around midnight, and one of the kids got stranded out there. His name was Shorty Caldwell. He was actually the star football uh, quarterback at the time, Round Rock High School. He was out there stranded right the same, right in the same spot my friend Jordan had the, the sighting. And he says that on his walk back to town, he was chased out of the area by what he described as a wild, hairy man. When he got to school the next day, he told everybody and it just caught like wildfire. And shortly after that, the name Hairy Man Road was official. It, it You can go there and it, I'm not saying that's what the locals call it. You go there and it has a street sign saying Hairy Man Road. <laughs> but it, it, it's, there's a long history of, of activity here that when people think of Bigfoot or Hairy Man sightings, they really don't think of Central Texas. They might think of East Texas. And uh, I'm not saying it's sad, but it, it's it's there's so much activity. It's kind of uh, overlooked or underappreciated by, by people who are researching in the Texas field. That's just my opinion. And I'm not really a Bigfoot researcher, a cryptid researcher, so to speak. I was investigating a story and it led back to this. And I... I in the end of the documentary, The Beast of Russia Creek, it really shows you how deep I, I go into the story when I actually trace back a uh, almost like a dungeon. It's it's really crazy. But one of my friends reached out to me with his brother, who was a construction worker working off of 620 there. And they found it's in the documentary. They found this. Uh, I mean, you, you have to describe it as a dungeon. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's like a cavern type looking thing it has a 1300 pound steel door on it that only locks from the outside and right next to the door there's a gigantic stone face of what looks like some weird looking beast type of thing it has an elongated nose long teeth and just dots on its face almost like tattoos or markings I have no idea to this day what that thing was or how it got there I have no idea it's in the middle of nowhere and the the I was sent the two videos of them finding it. It was partially buried by uh, by gravel and by branches they had covered over it. So when when I was sent this video, you see the guys they had just freshly taken out some of the gravel and branches, and they're looking at it like, "Holy crap, what is this thing?" And none of them go inside because they're too scared to go inside. But I looked for it for two weeks because they didn't give me the actual location of it they just gave me a general area so i had to look with with what they told me in, in gps i was able to find it. it took me about two weeks but when we found it we were really unprepared to explore it because i didn't think we were going to find it um but we do go inside and it, it's it's just creepy man and it's all in the documentary but uh, like i said i started researching one thing and it led to another thing and just another and it just goes to show you the uh, the high strangeness in the area that i really wasn't prepared for to be honest with you when you interview these people and, and and they tell you these stories like you having had your own experience did, did did they did you get these stories prior to your experience and then you were out there investigating and then it happened or did you have the experience and that it made you want to go out and look for it no i had my my experience beforehand but i'd never associated it with the bigfoot experience i associated it with something supernatural, paranormal. Uh, it was basically what I came to find out, like a bluff charge. This thing was had had to be within 10 feet of us, but we never saw it. And to this day, I'm like, why didn't we see it? And there were six of us out there fishing uh, at the time. And we did this all the time. It was right behind my house. We would walk to the Brushy Creek uh, and just go fishing out there. And we did this several times. But this was in 2011 when we had uh, the worst drought in Texas history. So the the streams were the creek was pretty much at a trickle at that point. So they were just pools and the fishing was awesome because they were fish literally trapped like in a, in a barrel, you know, they were in these little pools. So we caught a bunch of fish and I don't know if we maybe pissed something off catching so many fish uh, and it was a drought. So I'm not really sure, but I know as we were leaving, there was six of us. We could have taken anything. If it was a person we were ready, you know, we could have handled ourselves. We're, we're big boys at the time. And uh, this thing just charged at us. And my friend Brady picked up a rock and he threw it. And when he did that, it stopped. But I'm saying like it charged at us to where like it felt like someone was playing like a heavy metal song. And it was like they were cranking it up loud as you can. 
and we felt it. We could feel it. And we knew we had to do something. We were at like in our last resort there. And he just picked up a rock and threw it. And when he did that, dead quiet, dead silence. And uh, again, I never really associated that with, with a Bigfoot sighting until I got older and I started researching the area. And, and these other ones, these other sightings just kind of added credence to what was happening to me. Uh, and again, I wasn't, when I started the documentary, I wasn't really focused on looking for anything that I couldn't explain, but that's really what ended up happening in just interviewing people just kind of cemented my belief in there's something out here. It's been out here for a really long time. I had a question for you, Eric, if you wouldn't mind circling back to that dungeon that you had found, <clears throat> would you be able to get to disclose like some of what you found in there or would you rather wait for your documentary to come out? No, I mean, it's out. It's, it's in the beast of brushy Creek. You can see it. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it was, there was really not much inside. It was, like I said, the outside is more interesting. Inside, we really never found the end of it. Um, we just got to a point and then we turned around because we were terrified. I was terrified, at least. My friend David wasn't as scared as me. But when I go back and look at it, if that door would have closed, no one would have been able to find us. We would have been trapped there to this day. Uh, no one knew where we were. And it was, you know, I had nightmares after that, you know, after we found it. Because I was just like, how stupid was that? Man, that was really dumb going in there like that. Yeah, but you I mean, would have. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, you would have had to have had a team of, of yeah. people to properly explore that thing. You know, you'd have to have someone at the door. You'd have to have someone who knew where you were. That's fascinating, but terrifying to me. <laughs> you were smart to be scared. I would have been too. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and uh, I've shared this, you know, Doug Hycheck, who uh, was a friend of mine looked at it and he's convinced he's like, dude, that thing's a Bigfoot. The thing that's carved on the side of it is a Bigfoot. And I'm not so sure, but it's, it's, it looks like an elongated human. Like once you see it, you'll be like, what the heck, what is that doing out here in the middle of nowhere? Like it's insane. And it kind of resembles the other stone face that I was talking about, the bear man stone face. It looks like in, it's in the same motif, if you will, um, carved out of stone like that. So, yeah, it's I mean, so strange. I have no idea what that's doing there in the middle of nowhere. Uh, yeah, I have no explanation for that whatsoever. I was not expecting to find that. I was pretty much wrapped up with the documentary when I got that information. And was the inside of it just like a just like a cavern, or was it like actually meticulously carved out into into like a a space? I, I mean, it looked like a cavern to me, but they were they were areas to where. It went up, down, left, and right. Like they were, they were crevices that went straight up. There were crevices that went left and right, almost like, yeah. I mean, you could say maybe someone picked at it or it could have been a, a natural formation. I'm not sure, but there were just so many ins and outs of that, of that little, it was like a, uh, a really, uh, it was hard to explain. I mean, it's just kind of like a uh, matrix in there of just little crevices and cracks you could sneak into. That's so disturbing. Yeah, and the, the very uh, it's in the documentary when when you look up at one of these little cracks, spiders are just raining down from it, man. Oh, like it's, as it's if that crazy. wasn't as if it wasn't enough just to find that. Yeah. Oh yeah. God. Yeah. That's the icing yeah. on the I mean, the cherry on top right there. Yeah, it was. You know, I, I really have no explanation for that. And like I said, I've shared it with Doug, and and he's he has he's like, dude, I have no idea, but that thing looks like a Bigfoot. And they used a thirteen hundred pound steel door that only locks from the outside. Like if you're building a shed, that's that's overkill, man. Something had to lift it and hoist that thing down into this area. Like it's a sunken in area. It's not like it's not built into the side of anything. It's it's sunken in that and like I said, it was partially buried with gravel and, and branches and stuff like that. Well, have you heard of Martin Grove's encounter and with the beast of the LBL? I don't think so. The reason I'm bringing that up is because that giant steel door, that which was the entrance to that place, yeah. is fascinating to me because Martin Groves had an encounter with, with this strange creature that was known as the Beast of the LBL. But before he saw this this creature, he heard what sounded like a giant metal door like slamming. I've heard that before in other accounts too, yeah. There's got to be some correlation. Like It sounds like something was being kept in it's these what you feel spaces. Like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you, you definitely, when you see it, you're like, this, something was kept here, something, and it had breathing holes to it. Oh, they were breathing really? holes. Like, yeah, they, at the top of the, at the top of it, they were like two breathing holes. So that kind of, when you're thinking like shed or something, you want to keep out 
you know, animals and other stuff, uh, that kind of eradicates that theory off the bat. You have no answers for it. I really do. I have none. Man. Yeah. And I've heard of other, other so-called, you know, uh, similar things like, like not necessarily a dungeon, but other underground structures, um, similar to this. And, um, if you come into Round Rock, you'll see that we have a lot of underground uh, tunnels and walkways and stuff like that. So I, I'm not sure if they're just kind of taking advantage of something that's already there or if they're doing it themselves. But we, we do have a lot of underground passageways in Round Rock here where I am. Yeah, there's a lot of real estate right underneath our feet. Yeah, definitely. So we hate to leave y'all hanging, but we're going to do it anyway, because that's all the time we have for this week's episode. But we're coming back at y'all this Friday night with a live stream, as well as this Sunday night with a live stream. And as always, next Tuesday, we're going to release another standalone episode. And next Thursday, we'll release our third and final episode of this three-part discussion with Eric Palacio. So we're staying busy, giving y'all the most we can and the best we have. And once again, check out Eric's channel on YouTube, Media Palace. Head over there and show him the same love that you show us. But for now, good night. Don't let the cryptids bite. There's probably one outside your window right now. You should go check it. Anyways, good night.